Education. The governor and other state legislative leaders call it their number one priority. It's also the prime focus for Idaho Business for Education. Now, that organization has teamed up with HP to study the GEM State's long-term education and economic competitiveness. Today, IBE President and CEO Rod Grammer on the study's focus and goals and on the organization's legislative priorities. Plus, the College of Western Idaho's request for millions of dollars to build a health science building fell less than 150 votes short of passing. The college's leaders are now figuring out what to do next. CWI President Burt Glandon on where things stand and the top education issues the college is concentrating on this legislative session. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Idaho Business for Education says its goal is the same as the state's, to have 60% of Idaho's 25 to 34 year olds hold a post-secondary education credential by 2025. To help reach that goal, IBE has teamed up with Hewlett Packard, HP, on a study about the future of education in Idaho with their eye on helping the state develop the workforce businesses will need in the future. Today, to discuss the GEM State's education and economic competitiveness is Idaho Business for Education President and CEO, Rod Grammer. Rod, first of all, thank you for being here and welcome. Doug, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming in for, and giving us your time. First of all, can you tell us what is I, IBE and what is your overall mission? IBE is, a, we have nearly 200 members all across the state from Sandpoint, Clear to Idaho Falls, Pocatello, even clear over in Soda Springs whole mission is to try to improve the education system in Idaho so that we can create the workforce we need. And as you mentioned in the introduction, the state needs at least 60% of its workers to hold a post-secondary credential by the year 2025. Actually, we need them now, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've embraced that same goal. So we're, we're working with the governor, legislature, state board, and others to to achieve that goal. Now this uh, big study that you really just started within the last couple of weeks, you announced it, a partnership with HP. Um, it's an employability study, education, um, economic competitiveness. What are you hoping to learn from this study? Well, I call it a landscape study, and that is we're gonna go out all across the state, we're gonna conduct interviews, focus groups, online surveys, and we're going to do a landscape study of Idaho to try to determine you know, what is the status of education? You know, what's working, what's not working? What are our challenges? What are our op opportuni opportunities? And we're hoping that we can, from this study, make some recommendations to the governor's new Our Kids, Idaho's Future Task Force on where education could be going uh, down the road. Um, as you know, uh, in 2013, uh, Governor Otter started a K through 12 task force to improve education probably the most successful task force in Idaho mm -hmm. history. And they made recommendations and we create a five-year blueprint for education. I think what the governor wants to do, in fact, I know what the governor wants to do is come up with another five-year plan for education. And I'm hoping this study can help inform their work. So what kind of recommendations that you, know, that you mentioned would, uh, do you think could come out of this? Well, for example, um, we still need to get broadband to a lot of our schools. Uh, th that's essential if we're going to shrink the state, our big state, and provide more education out in the rural areas especially. We need the broadband out in those areas. That could be one. Another one could be funding. Another one would, could be where to go with teacher salaries, uh, maybe even curriculum. Uh, it's, a wide, uh, it's a wide field on what we could cover. What is the impetus for it right now? Why is it needed? Why is the timing so key to, to, to learn all of this stuff in a relatively short amount of time? Well, I think the, the key is that for the last six years, we've been making huge progress in education. We've been investing in education, teacher salaries, reading intervention. Um, and a lot of that is credit to the go last governor's task force. And I think we all feel that we need a new plan to move forward. Uh, over the next five years uh, for this $1.6 billion enterprise we call education. Mm -hmm. So our, our hope is that we can do this study and we can come up with some ideas on what this new task force could recommend to the legislature, the governor, and the mm -hmm. state board. Um, we are literally going to talk to hundreds if not thousands of people around the state. I kind of imagine that this could be the biggest study ever done in terms of asking Idahoans what they want to do in mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. And I've asked HP to finish the study in June so that we can give it to the task force, but also 
uh, the governor starts working on his budget in September. So if there are any investments we need to make in education mm -hmm. in 2020, uh, we need to know by midsummer so we can get those to the governor. So that's why I asked them to finish it by June. Um, why partner with HP? Well, HP is one of our trustee members and um, they invited us out a few months ago to the campus here in Boise and they introduced us to Gus Schmeldon who is their worldwide education uh, person, uh, vice president of worldwide education. And he actually is based in Philadelphia. But he has gone all over the world to uh, Ecuador, to Hungary, and to other countries at the government's request to look at their education systems and suggest ways to improve them. This is the first time ever that he's done a study in the United States for a state. And frankly, um, when they invited us out to meet Gus, he said, I'd like to do a study for Idaho. And the first thing I said was, well, how much is this going to cost us? And he said, I'm going to do it pro bono. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a HP doing this uh, because they've got a history of doing this in other countries and decided that Idaho is a very important place where they operate. It's a big footprint here for HP. A absolutely. For it, was, it was really the first place outside of the Bay Area where they expanded back in the 1970s. So what are you hearing from your 200 members, the, the businesses that are part of the Idaho Business for Education, in terms of, of what they need for the workforce in well, the years to come? We frankly need workers with post-secondary skills. And it doesn't have to be a four-year degree. It can be a workforce-ready certificate. A, two-year associate's degree like Bert's uh, delivering over at CWI could be a four-year degree or even an advanced degree because Idaho is the most under physician state in the United States so we need more medical doctors as well so right now uh, our our workforce is stuck at 42 percent that have these credentials it's the sixth lowest educated workforce in the United States so nothing short of Idaho's economic future rests on attaining the 60% goal. It is that important. And we don't see that as an academic goal or just a mathematical formula. That, that is crucial to the survival and expansion of businesses in Idaho. And, and that means it's, it's crucial to the quality of life of Idaho to attain this goal and create the workforce we need. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left in this segment. I want to talk to you a little bit about some legislative priorities that you have. You, yeah. uh, your organization has put out a pamphlet, and right near the top, you have early learning early listed learning. as a key um, legislative priority for this legislative session. Why early learning? Well, when I survey our members, and I, every year I say what I give them a list 12, 15 public policy issues, and early education is always number one on their list. All these hardcore business leaders, they say early education. Mm -hmm. Here's why we need it. Here's the big why. We have 55% of our kids who come into kindergarten not ready to learn how to read, which means many of those kids will never read proficiently by the fourth grade. And if they don't read proficiently by the fourth grade, their chances of dropping out of school, ending up on social services, ending up in the correction system, or under or unemployed most of their lives increases hugely. So we have to make sure that all kids in Idaho can read proficiently by fourth grade. And if they come into kindergarten, here's how I frame it. The kids who come from financially advantageous families, when they, when they come to kindergarten and the gun goes off to start the, the mm -hmm. race for their education, they're ready to start running. The kids who aren't, 55%, and even higher among our, young, our, un, our low income kids, they've got to run a whole mile just to catch up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem, these kids never catch up. So this is foundational to all the success we're going to have downstream on math scores, reading scores, SAT scores, go on rate, uh, reading is foundational to it all. You heard Governor Little say that in the state of the state. Well, this yeah, is where it started. Literacy, early literacy, right. K through three, has, right. has been a big platform right. of his right. since very early on in the campaign. And this is where it starts mm -hmm. in early education. The, the best investment we can make in education, best return on investment is in early ed. Um, uh, James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago has done research on this and he argues that this is the best place to put your money. Briefly, um, you're also a big supporter of in continuing to increase teacher pay. Um, do you believe that that needs to continue happening beyond this five-year career ladder plan that we've been hearing so much about? Yeah, we, uh, we believe and always have believed that this five-year commitment is only a five-year commitment and that we need to keep investing in the career ladder after this because our teachers, we're losing too many teachers to other states 
and we're losing them to other careers. And we have to make our salaries competitive. And we fully endorse the governor's proposal of 40,000 for starting teachers. In fact, we support the original idea of 40,000 for starting teachers, 50,000 for mid-career, uh, and 60,000 for master teachers. Rod, thank you very much thank for you, your Doug. perspective on these education issues. I'm wondering, uh, hopefully you can come back after June when you've got the results from the study, and perhaps you and Gus uh, Schmeldon from HP can come back to discuss what you found. Love to do that. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Rod. Pre pleasure having you on. Thank, thank you very you. much. Well, still ahead on Viewpoint, so close and yet so far. The College of Western Idaho's request for millions of dollars to build a state-of-the-art health science building on its Napa campus came up fewer than 150 votes short in November. So now what? Next, CWI President Burt Landon answers that question. It's the final days of the epic sell-off at Furniture Row. And when we say epic, we mean epic. Shop today and find incredible discounts store-wide. That means epic savings on sofas, sectionals, and accent chairs. Epic markdowns on dining groups, tables, and bar stools. Epic deals on bed sets, dressers, mattresses, and adjustable bases. Plus, four years no interest financing. Epic styles, epic selection. All with epic savings. Only at Furniture Row. Hurry, sale ends Thursday. Would you like to see some of the best products Idaho has to offer? Then plan to stop by the Buy Idaho Show at the Capitol Building on January the 30th. Over 100 businesses will participate in this signature trade show event with displays promoting, sampling, and sharing Idaho products and services. Now remember, admission to this show is absolutely free, so come on and build the economy. To post your local event, visit the Idaho Events Calendar at ktvb.com. Some more. What's he doing? Lisa, I want some more. More? He has asked more! Thank you. Well, he did say please. Yes, he did. And thank you. Please. And thank you. Pass it on. Thank you. Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcast. In the November election, nearly 232,000 people cast votes on whether to approve the College of Western Idaho's request for a $39 million levy to build a health science building on the Napa campus. The measure needed a 55% majority to pass. It came up short by 144 votes. Remember, that's out of 232,000 votes. It went to a recount, but still failed. Now the college's leaders are looking into and talking about what to do next. My guest today is CWI President Bert Glandon. Bert, it's always good to have you on. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us, Doug. We really appreciate getting, being able to come and talk about things. Well, you are welcome, sir. First of all, let's just start with the Health Science Building. How hard was that, that narrow loss to but swallow. I, I think it's really, really difficult. It's, it's, it was difficult for our locally elected board. I think it was difficult for the faculty and the staff and administration in terms of, okay, where do we go from here? And I think sometimes you'd rather really lose than lose by such a short margin in terms of what's going on because you constantly second guess yourself, what if, what if, what if, what if we did this, what if we did that? And we, we both times that we've gone out for bond or levy at CWI, uh, we cannot use any state funds, so we have to rely on community people to donate money to run a campaign, and, and somebody other than us has to run a campaign. The college really doesn't run the campaign. We can educate uh, mm -hmm. about the, what it would do and what would happen, but uh, we cannot advocate, we cannot tell people how to vote. And after the, f the first uh, bond that we had, I mean, our board members uh, went out to the community. That was the $180 million. $180 million, dollars, it was expansion. three buildings. Yeah. It was really building out the campus in Napa big time. And uh, our board members actually uh, went out and started interviewing, having uh, listening sessions in the community. And what came back from the listening sessions in the community was the health science building was the number one priority. Mm -hmm. 
It, everybody saw it as a huge need. Everybody saw it as a priority. We had the industries, the hospital. We had two brand new hospitals going in, one just a mile up the street from us, and two exits west of it is uh, St. Luke's new hospitals going out in the Nap area. I mean, quite frankly, we said, this has got to be a winner. So when we, and we moved it from a bond which needed 66 and two thirds percent vote to a levy which only needed 55% of the vote and dropped it from 180 million to just the health science building, which the was 39 million. the 39 million. And uh, the legislature put, gave us the seed money of 10 million. If we raised the 39 million, we'd, we would get the 10 million from the state building comp fund in order to make that work. Okay, so what are the discussions now? What are you thinking? What are the, what's the board thinking about the next step on this? Well, the board in January met and conferred, and they sat down and said, okay, of course we did all the second guessing. What if we'd done this? What if we'd done that? What if something else had occurred? And uh, one of the really tough things that the board talked about was where we were located on the, on the, on the ballot, which it was a four-page ballot, and we were on the fourth page. And when they did the recount, I think one of the curious things that came about was when they did the recount, the, we sent two people to observe, which is what you're supposed to do. So it's two of our staff went and observed the recount process. They weren't involved in it, but they just observed. Mm -hmm. And some of the comments that came back to the board on that was, on a four ballot vote, there were a lot of fourth pages that were just blank. People just didn't fill them out. Mm -hmm. And so we were wondering, is there just an, a, an, a voter exhaustion after three, three pages? Or how, how does that really occur and, and how could we have done that differently? We are now, the board is really, really uh, looking for more information. I know that the board chair, uh, Skip Smizer, and the vice chair, Mark Dunham, and the other board members, we have two brand new board members as of November as well, uh, that are, we're going out, we're talking to the hospitals, we're talking to the healthcare industry, we're trying to assess uh, whether we can get the support active support and quite frankly one of the other things that occurred in this last election was the hospitals were consumed with the Medicare Medicaid issue mm -hmm. and that was a major major uh, for the healthcare industry to to tackle that one and make sure that one was taken care of so not that we were not uh, of interest to them but their priority yeah was that so what is the focus then right now are you thinking putting it back on a, a ballot before June when that $10 million of seed money from the state legislature will essentially go away if you don't get the, the $39 million? Or is it about really just now deciding what you need to do? Actually, uh, the, the, the board in February, January we had a meeting, we discussed it for about an hour or so. Uh, the, they, will make a they, they need to make a decision in February as to whether we're going to go out in May or not. And some of the big concern is can we, ra we the two campaigns that we've run prior, we had for the 108 million, we had 15, a community put together 15,000 and we had 90 days. Uh, this last uh, election for the levy, we had $50,000 that the community put up to run a campaign and we had 90 days. And we're wondering, this is probably not enough. There's people that have told us, advisors that have said, you need about $100,000 you need at least 90 days, if not 120, to make it work, to run a full-blown mm -hmm. campaign. And you need to make sure that you've got the right things in place to make this work. I know that one of the other things that our board is really struggling with is, one, we need to make, probably make a decision, and the board needs to make a decision in February. We're running out of time mm -hmm. just to get to the, the, the May election. Two, I think what they're also assessing is what else is on the ballot this coming uh, um, uh, May election and one of the big issues that was discussed at the last board meeting was the 180, 200 million dollar uh, jail uh, in uh, Canyon County. So right now, it sounds like the big the big question is whether to go forward with another bond or levy issue right now. Correct. Correct. Always can go again later in the later, future, but yeah. that 10 million won't be there. Well, exactly, exactly. Unless they approve it again. Well, unless they approve <laughs> it again, and that would be that would again that's a part of the conversation is how do we struggle with if we don't go in May, if the board decides not to go in May, then how do we then talk to the legislature and the governor's office and whatever to try and figure out to buy more time for us to position ourselves to 
to get to the community. And again, the issue with the Health Science Building is you, you figured you could put 2,500 students through there. New, uh, new students. About uh, per year or every two all, years? Every year. With, what is it, phlebotomists? We, um, all kind, there's all kinds of healthcare technicians. There's nursing programs. There's phlebotomists. There's uh, also the dental assisting program would be there. The synergism of putting all of those health science programs in one building was huge. Mm -hmm. We would gain huge capacity. And our conversations with the hospitals was, we would actually be working with the local hospitals about one of the language things that we changed was it's not time to completion that we were talking about with nurses. With both of the hospitals we were talking about, they said, look, let's quit talking about time to completion because we hire all your graduates. We hire every graduate that you turn out. If you can show us and if we can work together collaboratively with the hospitals and business and industry and the healthcare and find ways to reduce the time to competency, meaning that when they graduate and they go to the hospital, their value added to that hospital in 30 days, not in 90 days. In 30 days, they're actually highly, pro they're productive mm -hmm. people. And we were in serious conversations about how to realign the curriculum, how to put things together that would make a graduate of our CWI program uh, competency-based where they'd be value added within 30 days or 45 days, which would save a huge amount of money to the hospitals. I'm mean, huge. It would save a lot of money mm -hmm. to the hospitals and it'd be value added that we worth investing in. And that's part of our conversations with the healthcare industry. How do we make competency quicker, faster, more efficient, both for the student and for the industry to get a value added? Well, Bert, I, I'm such a big issue, the whole thing around there. I'm sorry that took up all of our time <laughs> today, but I'd love to have you on again to talk about some of the other big right. issues that are swirling around about dual credits and the popularity of your uh, career technical education yep. and everything. So please, will you come back on Absolutely. again in the future and talk about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Thank again, you, Doug. Thank you so much. I know the time flies when we're yeah, sitting yeah. out here. Right. Well, still ahead on Viewpoint, these high school students mean business, and they've got that business down to a T shirt sweatshirts, golf shirts, and other products. Their entrepreneur experience next. Fred Meyer is here to make your healthcare choices easier. If you're enrolled in Medicare Part D, we may save you money with co-pays as low as $0 with our preferred pharmacy pricing on most Part D plans. And that's just the start. Fred Meyer also offers low prices on all the fresh, nutritious foods you love, plus all the wellness essentials you need for your healthy lifestyle. Visit us online to learn more or talk with one of our pharmacists today. It's Ellen's birthday. I thought it would be nice if everyone in the audience brought a gift for you. A lot of them are very light. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, Miley Cyrus, Mark Ronson, and Tom Hanks from Smithville, Missouri. <laughs> Plus, a huge surprise for Ellen and the audience, too. Oprah used to do this a lot before she abandoned us. <laughs> it's Ellen's Big Birthday Show. Weekdays at 2 on Idaho's News Channel 7. Who would want to jump into a freezing lake? You did. And you did it in record numbers. Over 425 of you took the plunge or volunteered, and you raised a record amount of money, more than $50,000 that will make wishes come true for kids. Thank you for making this year's Make-A-Wish Great Polar Bear Challenge the best ever. And welcome back once again to Viewpoint. We're going to continue our focus on education on this episode of Viewpoint right now. I want to tell you about some students in one class at Melba High School who are all business, as in running a business. Their teacher is giving them a true entrepreneur experience. It is learning about setting up your own business. Students in Heidi Sturm's Entrepreneur Experience class at Melba High will certainly profit from their education in the long run, but also right now. We figure out how much we want our shirts to sell for. They work together as a company. A company that produces shirts, t-shirts, sweatshirts, golf shirts, plus small purses, mugs, and hats. Lots of hats. 
It's like more hands-on, I think. I think that's what I like about it. They all have a hand in designing. Yeah, that's good enough. Heat pressing and embroidering the products. Most with Melba High logos, but some other sayings too. I'm the one who presses the shirts, so I'm the one that makes sure the shirts, the designs on the shirts are straight. I think they've kind of been surprised at some of their designing skills that they didn't know that they had. And selling the stuff, a point of pride when they see someone wearing their work. Honestly, it makes me feel good because it's like I made that shirt. It's satisfying to me to see them create something and have it sell. They put most of their profits back into the business and set aside some to take a field trip to see how other businesses operate. Learning more about what we do because we don't know everything, obviously. No? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Unlock it and start it. Sturm believes the entrepreneur experience could unlock a desire in her students to start a business in the future. That would be cool. They were talking about that. A couple of them have that desire to own their own business. Heidi Sturm, this week's Innovative Educator. The students in the Entrepreneur Experience class also take care of the concession stands for school events. They do the inventory, the stocking, product selection, and accounting. Now, if there's a teacher you would like to nominate, you can email us at innovativeeducator at ktvb.com. We feature an innovative educator every Monday morning on today's morning news, and then we also will show that again on the following Saturday morning news. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news, and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. Have a great day.